number 90, People X Rail Preston versus Nassau County Sheriff's Department. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. May I proceed? You may. May it please the court, my name is Sarah Rabinowitz and I represent the appellant, the Nassau County Sheriff's Department. First, may I reserve two minutes for rebuttal? You may. Your Honors, as this court is aware, this case is about judicial discretion and it really comes down to a question of who should have the last word on whether a bail bond package contravenes public policy. The criminal justice system, whose primary interest in setting bail is to secure a defendant's return to court, or a for-profit industry, which stands to make a profit regardless of whether the defendant returns to court or not. Amici for Petitioner really tries to frame the issue here that this is all about appellant throwing an obstacle in front of indigent defendants to prevent them from achieving pretrial release. That is not at all what this is about. A judge having discretion at a bail source he hearing to determine whether the bond agent is reliable, the value and, su and sufficiency of any security offered, and whether any feature of the bond package contravenes public policy does not equal indigent defendants have to sit in jail. Amici, as Amici argues, many of the bond packages presented by indigent defendants do pass muster under CPL 52030. It is not an extremely high bar to reach. And judges are sympathetic to indigency arguments. But those arguments are appropriate for the bail source hearings, not here, where the question is as to the scope of the court's authority at those hearings and the legislative intent behind the pertinent statutes. Nor would it drastically change the scope of these hearings or significantly increase the amount of bond packages disapproved if, if this court were to determine that the Supreme Court here acted within its discretion when it disapproved this bond package. I think the court could challenge the bond company's assessment numbers, like, oh, the property's not really worth $250,000. Well, Your Honor, that's, that's not what the court did here. The, the, so the, why is that different? What's different is that here the court looked at the nature of the collateral in the sense that did the indemnitors here really have enough to lose to incentivize the defendant to return to court? But it, it, that's very different from the insurance company's calculus as to the risk it, it, the, the company is willing to taste. Let's say I, a company comes in and says the property is worth 250000 and the judge is inquiring maybe it's worth 150 and you own it. So isn't that kind of go to what the value is the same way your equity would? Well, Your Honor, but that's not what the Supreme Court did here. The, the bond agent testified that the pro testified very clearly about what the equity was in each piece of property. And the Supreme Court determined and it w acted fully within the ambit of its statutorily imposed discretion in doing this that not only that the, that the value was insufficient, but that the nature of the collateral was insufficient. The Supreme Court also well, what is it? What is it you point to exactly for the nature as opposed to the sufficiency of the amount? Well, Your Honor, the Supreme Court questioned, um, th there was strong evidence here that, first of all, a big part of this collateral, which was the co-defendant John Bobrin's house, was uh, there was strong evidence that it was the product of ill-gotten gains. Where is the evidence in the record of this case for that? I see that the judge said that, but I didn't see anything in the record that, that, that suggested it. Your Honor, the, in, in the search warrant affidavits, which were before <coughs> the judge here, um, the, it, it was all lined out in, in those affidavits. And the judge did state in his ruling that there was strong evidence, or I should say that it was alleged that a large-scale drug transaction occurred in the driveway of this property. And it was all laid out in the search warrant affidavits that there was a... A, a drug transaction occurring in the in the driveway of the property is different from the house being acquired by the fruits of illegal activity, right? Your Honor... It's a forfeiture versus a where did the funds come from issue. 
Your Honor, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but in the search warrant affidavits, it's, it's specifically stated that uh, two kilos of drugs were seen changing hands in, in, this, in the driveway of this property as well. There was um, a 2011. Why does that go to whether the source of the funds to buy the house came from a drug transaction? The house had been owned for 20 years? Well, Your Honor, the, the, there's property, and there was evidence of this, it had a rich history stretching back having to do with large-scale drug transactions. In 2011, in a Queens case, um, both Petitioner and his cousin John Bobrin had been convicted of um, uh, drug possession, weapon possession that were found in this house. So of course, there's never really going to be evidence in the sense that at the, at the closing on a property, it's not as if there's- only actually matters if you're restricted uh, to only looking at whether or not uh, this is this, you know, the criminal activity is the source of the funds. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure that the statute restricts it that way. It, it, does, it, is, it does not, Your Honor. There's very broad language okay. um, that, any, that the court has a statutory mandate to analyze whether any feature of the undertaking. Anything that you see in the statute that distinguishes between uh, insurance company uh, bail bonds versus cash bond? Absolutely, Your Honor. Although there is a public policy component um, when conducting a bail source hearing as to either of them. And that's, that's the key point here, isn't it? Is that the public policy component really defines the difference here. One, it's, it's fine for an insurance company or a bail bond company to say we've made a business decision here that we're going to get repaid. It's another thing to say their business decision, though, has nothing to do with ensuring that a particular defendant shows up. They're, they're calculating their business decision by a profit motive, which is appropriate, but it has nothing to do with fulfilling the court's public purpose, and the court is allowed to look to that public purpose, which is that whoever's accused shows up. Isn't that really what this is about? That is what this is about, Your Honor. And the, back to your question, the, the difference between, th there is a threshold requirement for um, a court to conduct a, a bail source hearing as to cash bail that is not there when, when conducting the inquiry into insurance company bail bonds, and that is that upon um, application by the district attorney, there, um, the court must have reasonable cause to believe that the person posting a cash bail is either not in rightful possession of that money or that the money is the product of ill-gotten gains. I think it's very- See, see there's, there's really two questions. Is, 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 there, um, uh, is the collateral sufficient to ensure that the defendant will return to court not as a collateral sufficient for them to be able to make the, uh, um, uh, the percentage of 6% or whatever it has to be charged and some future date pay back the, the uh, bail bond company. The court doesn't care if the bail bond company gets paid back or not. What they care about is whether or not he'll show up. If the collateral's insufficient to do that, then that's a legitimate thing for the court to look at. That's the way I understand the judge's question. Well, absolutely, Your Honor. It's, a, it's an entirely different calculus. The, the insurance company's one and only goal is to make a profit, and generally that is achieved as soon as the company collects a non-refundable premium on the bond, but that is not the job of the bail setting court at the bail source we hearing. No, in this case, if, if after the forfeiture, there, it, it was actually paid out on to the city or... I'm sorry, Your Honor? Do we know if the forfeiture was paid out on? Because I know it has happened and a number of them have not been paid out on. Well, well, Your Honor, I don't believe there, there actually was a forfeiture in oh, this okay. case. Right. But that is true, that, uh, that it's a common and often unpunished practice for forfeitures to go unpaid, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, it's the district attorney's office is tasked with collecting on the forfeiture, and very often it expends more time and resources going after that money than the money itself. And there's always the remedy of remission, that, which is a common remedy often used under 54030, and the insurance companies can even negotiate with the court and the prosecutor to lower the amount of money to, to satisfy the judgment. Um, it, it, sh it actually shows remarkable uh, vision on the part of the legislature uh, in light of what have been described as unscrupulous practices, predatory practices by the insurance company industry in issuing these bail bonds. This court in 2017 in Gavorkian declared a legal one such practice of um, retaining premiums even, even after a bail application has been denied. Uh, there's a 
well-documented history in the bail bond industry of uh, pre presenting bond packages with little or no collateral, that sounds familiar in this case, and then, and then lie, even lying in court papers about the amount of collateral. And in light of all of this, it, the same people who have called for the reforms in the bail laws are, are also the people who have called for more regulation and more transparency and more scrutiny on the bail bond industry, people like the governor, people like former Chief Judge Lippman. And, um, but to be clear, the, the way you're, you're analyzing or, or uh, advocating for construction of the rule and what, what a judge should do is that based on what is presented at the hearing, affidavits, testimony, whatever, that based on that information, that that's where the judge decides whether or not I'm persuaded that what is being put up for the bail will be enough to um, uh, ensure or at least uh, increase the likelihood of the appearance at court proceedings. You're, on you're, you're not saying the judge has to sit there and say, as I think Judge um, uh, Garcia was was trying to ask you about. I, I see you say it's worth two hundred thousand, but I just don't think so. I know that neighborhood, and it can't possibly sell for more than a hundred thousand. You're, you're not arguing that's what a judge no, should be doing. No, not at Saying all. Saying the judge going from, you say it's two hundred thousand. Let me see what else is in the evidence, whether or not I think that this may be enough. Absolutely, Your Honor. That that is not what appellant is is requesting at all, and th that that calls up a significant distinction between this case and Savage. In Savage, the bail setting court made no, just set, stated without further elaboration that the collateral was insufficient. And so as a result, and, and that was the sole purpose for the dis, um, basis for the disapproval of the bond package. So, so what are you asking then? Are you asking that the court, for a rule that says the court uh, uh, can only question the business judgment rule of an issuing company if the court finds that there's a potential violation of public policy. In other words, the defendants will not be brought back by what I see here. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, well, appellant is that the kind of rule you're asking for. Appellant is asking for this court to confirm um, or mm -hmm. validate the clear intent of the legislature that there is a statutory mandate under 51032A and under 52030 for the court to conduct this public policy analysis as as to the overarching reason for all bail and which continues into the bail source hearing. Uh, securing a defendant's court attendance, and and appellant is all properly consider testimony that it had heard the day before, or that it was aware of of the, one of the owners of the property saying a co-defendant, I believe, saying that he was uh, he was in fact indigent, and he was underwater, and he had he had no means uh, for for counsel. I, I think the court did properly consider that, that, and that was particularly significant as to the uh, Supreme Court's ruling that it, it didn't it, that it did not find the bond agent reliable. He he the. Andre Hunter, the bond agent, testified on the stand that he was not aware when he put together this bond package that co-defendant John Boberin was indigent and underwater, as he stated. And, the, and Judge Schwartz specifically stated in his ruling that he did not credit Andre Hunter's testimony as to his, in particular, his investigation of this Rosedale property. And that really what that I would like to take a moment to highlight how well-reasoned and detailed this ruling was. I, I believe that this is exactly the kind of 52030 ruling that the legislature contemplated when it enacted 52030 in the sense that I'm sure it cannot be that the legislator intended to have rubber stamped approvals of bond packages, many of which could be illusory. Um, it was as if Judge Schwartz really was going through a checklist of 52030 and went through each independent basis for disapproval of this bond package, which went to the nature and the value. Um, and I see my time has expired. It, it, in closing, Your Honors, appellant really only asked this court to validate the clear intent of the legislature that the business judgment of, a, of an insurance company is no substitute for judicial scrutiny as to whether a bond package contravenes public policy. Thank, Thank you, you, counsel. Counsel? Thank you, Your Honor. I'm Evans Priest, and I've kind of 
I represent uh, the respondent, Mr. Boban, who's made 19 appearances since this bail has been posted. Your Honor, the, the court sets bail. The court has nine choices. The court then has the right, under certain circumstances, to decide whether or not it wants to look at the collateral that people make the motion. In this case, uh, Savage had said that the insurance company makes a business decision based on the collateral. Bail is a form that's paid through insurance, just like everyone who has insurance on their house pays a small part every year, and it's, a, it's the law of large numbers. The bail bond business doesn't stay in business if people don't go to court. In New York County, for instance, they get a judgment within 120 days, and if that bail is not paid off in New York County, nobody for that company can post bail again in New York. Yeah, well, the, the question I don't think is the one that you're, you're trying to get to. Uh, the question isn't whether or not you can justify your conclusion that there's enough there for you to put your money and name behind it, <clears throat> behind the bail, but rather whether or not the court has an independent obligation and duty under the statute to I decide think, for itself I think whether, excuse me, whether or not the bail package is of the kind that will put the pressure and encourage the defendant to appear in court. Inevitably, inevitably, Your Honor, all bail is less than the full value of the bail when it comes to a bond, and the courts know that. Indigent families gather collective friends, and they come before. Right, but I think Judge Rivera's point is, doesn't the court have a role in saying, is it enough? Well, I think the court Whatever has the a, percentage is. I think the court, in, in, in examining the, the background, character, and nature of the indemnitors, does that. They look at those kinds of people, and they say, yes, we think the nature of these people, the income of these people, in that process, yes, they do take a role in it, and I think it's only reasonable otherwise but there is, a, there is another weight here that the insurance companies would not be in business very long if they didn't have a business judgment. And, and what the appellant is asking is, well, once we don't like that the fact that they want a second look, and the policy is if you make these steps, then we have to accept to some level, because when the court sets a bail, it knows inherently it's taking less than the full amount of yeah, But then bail. the statute would read that way. I mean, the statute doesn't read that a judge has no role. No. And that, that's the problem with my no. argument. The judge has a role, and the judge, uh, the, uh, the legislature from the statutory language doesn't seem to uh, intend for the judge not to have some role in determining whether or not Indeed, they're persuaded that the package is enough that the defendant will indeed return for appearances, the, the, or the, the, the likelihood the, is very great that they will. The difficulty, I, I, obviously, the court has a role to make sure that the law has not been violated yes. and that public but, policy is not. Can I stop you for one second? The, the problem with, with the law as it stands now on a business judgment rule is that the business judgment of a private insurance company is determinative of the validity of the underlying collateral. And, that's, and that does not satisfy on its face public policy because public policy is not for you to make a good business judgment, but for the court to be assured that a defendant will show up in court. And those are two different things. And if they conflict, you're gonna follow your business judgment because that's what you're in business for. You're right about that, everybody understands that. We need you, but the other side of it is is that that does not satisfy the public policy concerns. I, I, so how, what do you propose, what process do you propose that would satisfy the public policy arguments to, 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 to look at your underlying business judgment if it's not this hearing? What, how else will we do it? Well, I think, the court, I think the court can set a rule to ask the indemnitor, and it's done every day, mm -hmm. when the bail bondsman swears in before the court, the, court uh, the bondsman will come before the court and say, what are you putting up? and there will be a colloquy between the bondsman and the court. It happens every day, and the court will say, you know what, the car is not enough, or the mother isn't 
But what, does the, what does the not enough mean? Does it mean not enough of amount of money, or does it mean not enough of a tie to the defendant? And let me give you an example that one of my law clerks gave me that I'm having a tough time with. Let's see if you can do better than I. Suppose I'm arrested, bail set at a half a million dollars, and what I do is I start a Kickstarter campaign, and I get a thousand people to contribute small amounts of money to make that. I take that whole amount of money, which is more than the $500,000, I put it into an escrow, give it to a bail bond agent, with, and let's say it's a letter of credit or something like that. So you're absolutely guaranteed you're going to get your money. Let's say that all these people who are contributing, they're not criminals, they're, there's no nefarious way that they got their money. It's all legitimate money, and it's sitting right there. Couldn't a court say, but wait a minute, Judge Wilson has got no tie to this money at all, and despite the fact that the bail bond company is going to be made whole, this is not sufficient. He's not going to come to court. He's you know, going to the courts do that, and they do that, they do that in cases where members of churches will come in and they'll say, we would like to help a parishioner. So why isn't that what the court did here? Well, I think that the difference in here is I think the people here know the defendant. There are 20 relatives here who came forward. I think the difference here is the fact that it's more of an economic issue in this case than it really is about whether or not these people are going to stand by this person and collectively put together. Well, aside, aside from the fact that there were some other you know, ancillary things going on in this particular case, it seems to me that, again, that is what the court did. By looking at the individual people that were coming in to support the defendant and looking to see, do, really, do any of them have enough skin in the game so that they could be hurt badly enough that that the defendant, in, in trying to protect them, would be incentivized to return to court. I think the court in this case, per perhaps if the court were more explicit in saying, I don't trust these people to pay, I think that the, the business judgment in this case is the fact that these people are connected, they, they've satisfied 52030, that they're, that they're the kind of people that will pay. And to a certain extent, bondsmen count on that. And if they didn't do it, I mean, 2% of bonds but fail. They have, a, they have a whole profit and loss analysis here. First of all, they don't look at each case individually. They're looking, any insurance company, right, is looking at its, you know, its payouts and what it takes in is premium. So there's a whole weighing and balancing there that differs, it seems to me, uh, a lot from the individualized analysis that the court has to do about this defendant. So they may be willing to take a different kind of risk that they're going to get paid back if the de defendant doesn't show up than a court is willing to do uh, in terms of our system of justice if the defendant doesn't show up. I, I think to, if I think to, it, it helps defendants because when they because every judge has a different threshold today. There are certain judges that take five percent. There are certain judges that say ten percent, and so there's a different threshold. Um, and I think part of this, the value of the business judgment rule is when the court sets a bail bond bail. To some extent, they're aware, unless public policy is contravene where there's no ties, where there are not somebody that comes under the factors set in 52030, that it really is a more predictable result, which I think is also important to people, that there is a predictable result, and it's both to the court, to the defendants, and to the defendants' families. And I think because we have a large number of poor people in the criminal justice system, you're going to have, if, if it's truly so personal to the court and the comfort level just to the court, I think that's not helpful to defendants and it doesn't facilitate a predictable result in, the, in these cases as well. But of course the legislature understood that when it, when it carves out a role for the judge. Otherwise the rule would be if you can file a bail company that'll, that'll give you bail, that's good enough. Well, There'd be I, no I, need for the hearing. I mean, the way you've described it, that merely devolves to there's never a role for the judge and there's no hearing. Well, right. But that's clearly not what the legislature well, the, chose. Right. But they're clearly, there's always, it's hard to have a perfect system, but in <clears throat> the True. court, it, but in, in when, the, when the defendants stand up and they say what we're doing, mm -hmm. I think the, in balancing this, I think you have to 
give more discretion perhaps to the judgment of the company because most people aren't going to have the money. But again, that no. you may think that's better policy. You may think that's, that in practice that makes sense, but it's hard to read the statute in that way. And that perhaps is a reason that the legislature may want to reconsider the language. We know that for the whole new bail law in existence next next yes. year. <laughs> Correct. And Correct. and they didn't touch this subject matter, unfortunately, Correct. so we're here. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Correct. counsel. Your Honor, it's true that we will have all new many new bail laws going into effect in a few months. And I think it is very significant that the legislature did not touch CPL 52030. It is clear that um, But it did the, allow for charities. Absolutely, Your and Honor. And that sounds like not quite the Kickstarter, but it's it's kind of along the same lines of what Judge Wilson uh, Your, Your Honor, are you referring to the charitable bail yes. act? Well yes. addressing that, Your Honor it, um, comparing, and Amici for petitioner focused on this a great deal, comparing the legislative intent behind the Charitable Bail Act and, that, and the intent behind CPL 52030 is really comparing apples and oranges. Um, just the way the Charitable Bail Act is drafted, the significant limitations on the defendants who are able to be helped under that act. Uh, we're talking about defendants who are low-level defendants with, at, the way the law is now, it's only it only applies to misdemeanors. There's a two thousand dollar bail cap. These are not defendants who pose a high risk of flight. So it's clear that the intent behind the Charitable Bail Act was to help defendants who could not afford to pay five hundred dollars of bail, a thousand dollars, even two thousand dollars. Might not find a company who would for, who, would, who would give them bail. Right. Well, well, Your Honor, even, even if they did find a company, the, the, the nonprofit organizations that, that do post bail under the Charitable Bail Act, unlike the for-profit industry of the insurance company bail bonds, um, these are organizations that really it has been documented carefully vet the defendants that they help. In that sense, their interests align with the states. It, it, it's about- yeah, But that was his argument, that the, they too are very careful because they want to make money. They don't want someone not to show up because they lose money. You, well, Your Honor, as, as I said before, there are many uh, factors that reduce the risk of losing money, even if a defendant does abscond. And well, I thought your point on the Charitable Bail Act was, I thought this is what you were saying, perhaps I misunderstood you, that you're talking about a, a group of defendants that are very low risk. Absolutely. And that's what perhaps Counsel, is something I just, that distinguishes I, it. I see your light is on, but I have a question. In cash bail under this statute, when someone comes in with cash bail, are there limitations? It's a difficult statute to read, but are there limitations in what has to be a threshold showing before the judge can inquire into cash bail? Uh, your Honor, th that threshold showing that I talked about before, I really, th I really think that that is so significant because I think it highlights the legislature's intent here that there should be a difference between cash bail and insurance company bail bonds in light of the, well, well. But the way I read it then is if I come in with 250,000 cash bail that I've raised, in order to have an inquiry into that, there has to be some showing first, a preliminary showing that there's suspect source. or. So in Judge Wilson's hypothetical, where it's essentially cash bail coming in, would there still need to be that threshold showing or no? There's, there would, ha under the statute, Your Honor, the wording, plain wording of the statute, there would have to be that threshold showing. And I think that that's there because the legislature in, it, it, in furtherance of the state's interest in promoting pretrial release, the legislature did want to limit the court's discretion to some degree as to cash bail. So let's but say not the church gives me $100,000 cash bail under this statute. Does there have to be a showing that money is suspect before the judge can weigh whether it's sufficient or whether there's a policy reason to reject it? By the plain reading of the statute, Your Honor, there does. Um, upon, even after the district attorney's application, there has, the, the court must have reasonable cause to believe that um, either the person posting bail is not in rightful possession of the money or that um, 
it's the product of ill-gotten gains. But again, of course, this is not about the cash bail uh, situation here, right? So we can leave that for another day. Well, Your Honor, the reason the reason I the reason I was emphasizing is because I really think it highlights the legislature's intent for 52030 to be a, a further regulation on the bail bond industry, and that judges should not be forced to compel uh, to defer to it. If there are no further questions, I'll rely on appellant's brief. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.